this is this. There's a man in the Bible that, I mean, you talk about some stuff. He went through some stuff. His name is Jacob. And, and you look at his life. Jacob means subplanner. So he was a person who took a position from somebody else who was not. That wasn't supposed to go to him. It was somebody else's blessing. That and he way. took it. When Jacob took his spot, his brother's, Esau's spot, he said, oh, you can have the birthright. And his dad blessed him and everything. He did it twice to his brother. And then his mom and dad said, you know what? Uh, your brother's pretty mad. And what, what, what amazed me was his mom was in, involved in this. And she's like, um, I think you ought to leave. I think we ought to send you back to my, my uh, relative's house over over in this other country, and I think you ought to just go over there. So you helped your son get the, get the blessing, and now you're losing your son over this stupid blessing. Does that make any sense to you? Not one. So then we see that he's taken off, and he's going across the desert by himself, going to Haran. How sad is that? Show me how much respect this man had for his mom and dad. This man was 77 years old when he left his house. How many 77-year-olds you know that you still live around your mom and dad and aren't married yet? And God shows up. And he shows up in, in Jacob's dream. And he's like, oh, wow. This must be the, the place that God lives. He must live here. And it scared Jacob. Well, how is a 77-year-old man that is the son of Isaac be scared of God? And it says, Behold, the Lord stood above him and around him and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. I will give to you and to your descendants the land, the promise in which you are, are lying. So all that land, he said, I'll give it to you. Well, how's he going to give it to him if he's going back to his relatives over in Haran? He's supposed to stay in Canaan. So they, I mean, he said, wow, this is, this is an awesome place. This is where God lives. I mean, this is where, and he saw where the angels were going, ascending and descending up this ladder. And, and he like, says, I'm going to make a vow with you, God. I'm going to make a vow with you. He said, then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me, and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and clothing to wear. And if he grants that I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house, a sacred place to me. And everything that, I, everything that you give me, I will give the tent to you as an offering to signify my gratitude and my dependence on you. You know, that's one thing that I, I want to say. When you give your tithe, not only are you just saying, oh, I'm being obedient just to give, but you have to rely on God. You have to rely on God. I mean, you think about it. Sometimes when it's 10%, you're like, that's a big jump. That takes a big chunk out of your check. Maybe you need that. But just like my friend Lamar said, once you give it the first time, watch him move. Watch him move. Watch him move. But I wanted to show you this because this is Jacob operating in mustard-like faith. A mustard seed. He said, God, I'm going to trust you. I'm going to trust you that when I go, that you'll bring me back. And that you'll give me food to eat and clothes on my back. That's all he wanted. Before he left his dad and mom's house at 77 years old. How many 77-year-old? I'm not even that old yet. I already left my mom and dad's house. This man hadn't left yet. So God promises him, I'll do if you listen. He said, why? Because of your granddaddy and your dad. I'm going to watch over you. So we see Jacob going across the, the sand and goes back to Haran and he comes up to the well and he sees this. This beautiful woman, and he's like, wow, ah, she's got to be it. It's Rachel. And he meets her. And he's like smitten, 
So he goes back. They go back to her dad's house, mom and dad's house. And the dad says, well, so you like my daughter, huh? Okay. How about you work for me for seven years? And you can have her. You can have her. The man didn't even bat an eye. He was like, so I will, I will, I will, I will. <laughs> a sucker. <laughs> He's a sucker. That's a sucker, buddy. I, tell you. <laughs> I said, I would have put that in writing. <laughs> so you see Jacob there. He's working. Remember, he's deceived his, his, his dad into giving him the blessing, right? He even deceived his brother and got the birthright. But look what happens. But in the evening, he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob went in to consummate the marriage with her. Now you tell me, how in the world, Jacob, understand he see this girl, Rachel, and then the dad says, I'm going to pull a fast one on him because I'm going to get rid of both of them at the same time. So I'm going to bring in, I'm going to bring, now, now look, this is what it, you read in the Bible and it says that Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel had beautiful eyes and of nice form. Now you tell me, this man's watching this girl for seven years. Now you tell me he ain't, he, you know he's watching her. <laughs> He watching that girl for seven years. And you tell me I'm going to sneak him in. Now this girl had weak eyes. That means she probably didn't have the figure like Rachel. Now you telling me you like, oh yeah, that's, uh, hmm. Uh, hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah. So you tell me how in the world could you pull that one on that man? The only way I know is that man had too much to drink. That's what it was. He drank too much. When Jacob woke, it was Leah who was with him. And he said to Laban, what is this that you have done to me? Did I not work for you seven years? Are you kidding me? Why have you deceived and betrayed me like this? Well, maybe you shouldn't have done that to your brother and your dad. You don't do that to your dad. You don't do it to you. Just don't do it. And he did. Now you tell me all the junk that man went through. Now, was that birthright worth it? Was it worth deceiving your daddy? <laughs> so then uh, Jacob had to work seven more years for Rachel. So that was 14 years he worked for Rachel. He didn't say nothing about Leah. He worked 14 years for Rachel. But the good thing is he, he, after he got done, it says, after he got done consummating the, the, the marriage bed with Leah, that end of that week, he got Rachel. So he didn't have to wait that seven years, but he still had to work. So he, so daddy did the thing. He got rid of both of them at the same time. Said, yep, they're all yours now. You take care of them. So Jacob decides, I'm going to have family. This is where the whole house of Israel was born. The whole house. So you tell me. So he's taking care of two wives, and they're having kids. Rachel doesn't have any yet. So Rachel says, give me kids or, or, or I'll die. Well, you know, as a man, like, uh, I, mean, I got to take care of both these. I, I, it's not I, my problem. It's, it, you think I'm God? That's what he's telling her. I mean, you imagine all this stuff where he can't take care of this lady and give her any children. So these guys come up with the idea. And I, I've heard this before because Abraham wife did the same thing. Now, you guys, I need you to pay attention to this real good, real good, real good. See, when your wife tells you back then, she said, go ahead and have my, have my maid and so that you can have children because since I can't have them, you can have them. Now, that's a loaded question, fellas. That's a loaded question. That's loaded. That's loaded. You can't play with that. You should have already shot that down. Like, nope, I ain't touching that. Not touching that. My grandpa went through that. I ain't touching it. I ain't touching it. I ain't touching it. But what did Jacob say? Well, you know, hey, I got to obey my wife. I'm sure I'll do it. Are you kidding me? You're setting yourself up for fire. And he did. He did. You look at the children that came from those maids. They were not as blessed as the ones that came from Rachel and Leah. Uh, Judah come from Leah. And the other ones, Joseph 
and Benjamin came from Rachel. They were more blessed. More blessed. Is this like a soap opera? I mean, you imagine with Jacob, I mean, all this junk that he's going through, and you're like, okay, God, if you bring me back. I'm like, God, how are you going to bring him back when he's out there doing all that? All that junk. So now, he has all the kids. He's got all these children, 12 of them. Well, one was on the way. It wouldn't happen there yet. And then, you know, you know, Jacob was getting about fed up with his father-in-law because he keep deceiving him. He keep playing him like he played his brother. So, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in here that you can learn from. Don't play with people. Don't deceive people. Don't do that because whatever you sow will come back on you. And this man kept, he was like, I'm tired of this. Well, yeah, you should be. You should be. So then he said, okay, I, I'm, I got to go home. I'm, I'm missing my family. I want to take my wife and my children and go. And I, and, and, but I need to get paid for all the work I've done. And he said, I'll tell you what. You can go through my herd, take all the speckled and all the, all these, you know, all the different kinds of, of speckled animals or the black ones, and you can take them and take them with you. And it, see, it says in there that, that it seems like God had to, had to, had to just step in and start helping Jacob because this man was a great deceiver, a great deceiver. This, this Laban, he was bad news. So when he got all these goats and, 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 and cows and bulls and camels, and I mean, he had all this. He had all this stuff that he accumulated while he worked for him, and he was able to take it. Now remember, when he went to Haran, all he had was the clothes on his back and a staff. That's it. That's it. That's all he had. Now you tell me how much waiting that this man did. But anyways, he decides, okay, I'm leaving because this guy, he's crazy. He's going to try to steal some more stuff from me. He's going to try to take it. So he starts heading back. Well, then his father-in-law gets mad. Man, you didn't let me kiss my, what, my daughters goodbye. You didn't let me kiss my grandchildren goodbye. He, he was so mad and so upset, so he starts chasing after Jacob. Starts chasing after him. And then they meet up, and he's like, why didn't you let me do this? He's like, well, maybe because you weren't truthful with me. Like, I'm done with you. I wanted to take all my stuff and go home. Like, that's where I wanted to go. I'm showing you all this garbage that he went through But God used it to teach him something, to make him start trusting God more. That waiting part, you imagine how frustrated he was because he wanted to go home. All I did, I came here just for one year because it probably took him probably six months to get there. And he only wanted to come marry a woman and go back home. Instead, he stayed there for about 21 years. Now you tell me how much waiting he because remember, he prayed before he left there to go there. He prayed. He said, God, if you'll keep clothes on my back, food in my stomach, and, and, and watch over me and protect me. He said, I'll give you a tenth of what I make. He said, I'll bring, you, and, and bring me back home. 21 years later, he's back home. Back home. Now you tell me how much waiting. How much waiting have you done? How much waiting on the promise that God has told you? How much waiting have you done? I've been on one thing we have for about 20 years, and it's about up. How can you make your waiting decrease? How can you? By trusting God. You just got to keep trusting him because think about this. I want to show you some stuff that, that happens when you wait on God. When you wait on God, your faith grows. It grows. You don't think Jacob's faith grew? Oh, I knew it grew. I know it grew. Yeah. It says, I want to show you. This is what he said. He's back in his country. Getting ready to cross the, river, cross the river here. And he says, I am unworthy of all the loving kindness and compassion of all the faithfulness which you have shown to your servant. 
With only my staff long ago, I crossed over this Jordan, and now I have become blessed and increased into these two groups of people. Save me, please, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he will come and attack me and the mothers with their children. This man left with just him, himself, and the clothes on his back. That's it. Now he got two groups of people. Two groups. Now you tell me how blessed he was. You don't think he sat out there in them fields and prayed to God and said, God, please help me. I, I, I made a vow to you and I know that you, you are going to be with me and I know I can leave this place and I'll be able to go back home. How many prayers do you think he prayed like that? I know he did. I know he did. When he came home, he was 97 years old. 97, How many 97 years old? Taking care of children. Chasing after them. Taking care of the animals. 97? Are you kidding me? His faith grew out there. His spiritual roots grew deep. When you're going through this waiting process, your roots are growing down so that you can stand. If you can't stand, imagine what God has for you that you have to endure and your roots are not in the ground. It's just like a palm tree. You ever seen a palm tree after a hurricane? It's still there like this. It go like that, but it's still there. It go back that way and it still do that way. You put a maple tree there, it's like <laughs> oak trees. I mean, we cut them down, but man, them things are solid. But in a hurricane, oh, that thing's down. It's gone. It's gone. You guys are the palm trees. You got to be able to bend and come right back. Bend, come back. That's what them roots do. They grow down and they stay in the ground. Your spiritual strength. You know, you know it says it benefits a man more by trusting in God than pushing iron. Benefits a man more. <laughs> But you hear somebody that, that, that exercises their faith in, in, in the Word. Man, you just want to stand around them all the time. You're like, yeah, huh? okay, yeah, yeah. And you always want to be around them because they're spiritually strong. And you feel the peace. You feel the strength. You feel the blessing of God on their life. Amen? You know, the other thing is, while you're waiting on God, that your steps start getting in line with what God wants you to do. When you're waiting. See, when you're not waiting, you're going off here. I'm going to go try this. Oh, no, I'm going to go try that over there. You're all over the place. But when you're waiting on God, your steps start getting in order where he wants to take you. And when you get in that order, man, that's powerful. That's powerful. You know, there's strength in being quiet. There's strength in being quiet. Not always do you have to comment. When somebody says something to you. You know what we always say in our house. Don't return evil for evil. Return good for evil. Whatever they say to you. That's bad. Horrible. Return good. That's what the Bible says. And when you do that. Man there's such a blessing in that. You feel good. But when you turn that evil for evil. Oh you feel like garbage. Because you know you screwed up. It says it's hard to bridle that tongue between your lips. It's hard. But when you can get a hold of it, man, it's so powerful. So powerful. You know, when you start waiting, and it doesn't happen all of a sudden, but the blessings of God start coming to you while you're waiting on God. Blessings start coming. Sometimes not the exact one you're looking for, but blessings do start coming. They do start coming. You'll walk and you won't grow weary. You'll walk and you won't grow weary. You know, there's a, there's a verse in there. It says you'll mount up on eagle's wings and you'll soar. What does that mean? Are we going to grow e eagle wings? Like, you know, them guys on adventures, the adventurers, they had them wings. Is that what they call the adventures? Yeah. No. That means that you'll soar above all that garbage that weighs you down, 
that pulls you down and that junk won't weigh you down. People look at you like, why you got to smile? You like in bankruptcy. You're losing your house. You, you just got a divorce. Why are you smiling? They you know, another thing, too, is when you're going through something, depression comes on you. Man, it just saps the life out of you, doesn't it? You have no energy whatsoever. But when you're waiting on God in the right way, you'll run and not faint. People used to say, wow, how do how you have so much energy doing all this? I'm like, because uh, I'm just waiting. I'm just, I know God's going to answer me, so I just, I just wait. I just wait. Galatians 6, 9. And it says, let us not grow weary or become discouraged in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap if we do not give in. If we do not give in. If you do not give in. Jeremiah 17, 8. It says, for he will be nourished like a tree planted by the waters that spreads out his roots by the river and will not fear the heat when it comes. But it leaves but its leaves will be green and moist, and it will not be anxious and concerned in a year of drought, nor stop bearing fruit. Is that you? Have you stopped bearing fruit in your time of waiting? What about the drought? Have you let all this garbage come at you that's in our country right now? Man, just hits you and hits you, hits you every day. Do you watch the news and just go, uh... Or do you open up your word and read it and go, man, that feels so good. I'm glad I'm not part of this world. Here's a template my wife and I use, and it's you pray, you ask God, you put a seed on it. Sow a seed on it. You speak the word over your request. Then you wait on God to move. Then you reap your harvest. Five things. You pray, you put a seed on it, you speak the word over your request, you wait on God to move, you reap a harvest. Isaiah 30, 18, it says, Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him. Who long for him. He longs to be, he waits to be compassionate towards you. Isn't that amazing? That's Isaiah 30, 18. And he's a just God. Remember what I told you? There were times in my life that when I grew up that I was taken advantage of because of my strength and because of my understanding of what my dad taught me and people took advantage of me and they didn't pay me what I was supposed to be paid. And God kept track of that. And he's getting ready to pay me for what I was unjustly used. Unjustly used. He'll do the same for you if you've been unjustly used. He keeps track of that stuff. He so does. He so does. If you're a child of the Most High God, He keeps track of that. 